Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Mecha Ace, our evil read through. Things are starting to heat up, so let's dive right in with Episode 7 A Colossal Clash, the battle for Fleet Base Crown. Caliburn Battle Group near Fleet Base Crown, Vedria System. The Imperial Grand Fleet is no less impressive the second time you lay eyes on it. Rank upon rank of enemy warships, left untouched by the previous battle over Vedria, face you and your allies in perfectly arranged formations, daring you to attack them, to deal damage to the mighty sleek-hulled craft who had faced the Caliburn and her, pa and her battle group over Vedria and come through without a scratch. The fact that you were able to survive your first encounter is a comfort, but a slight one at best. How <clears throat> However, this time is different from your last engagement with the Imperial fleet. This time, you and your allies go into battle with the hope of something other than desperate defense in mind. This time, you have a chance at victory. This time, you have a fleet of your own. The Kodak force arrayed in front of Crown Station is nowhere near as well-ordered or uniform as the Imperial battle squadrons facing it, but the converted freighters, converted starliners, and the handful of purpose-built warships mount heavy particle cannons and missile tubes, missile tubes just as deadly as the ones carried by their Imperial counterparts. Better yet, for this fight, your allies almost match the Imperial ship in numbers. The Kodak Defense Committee has put every battle group every patrol squadron, and every armed vessel into this battle. With a, cru a crucial strategic objective like Crown Station and the approaches to the Rebellion's core system at stake, High Command has thrown together every battle-ready asset they could. This is the best shot at victory you're ever going to get. How do you feel about the upcoming battle? Oh, we are looking forward to getting ourselves some kills. I am not sure why the steam thing popped up. The entire fleet, the entire enemy fleet is arrayed in front of you. All you need to do is pick your victims, hunt them down, and tear them apart. A near unlimited supply of targets. This time, there will be no civilians to get in your way, and the entire fleet will be watching your back, making sure you won't get surrounded. Today is going to be a good day for bloodshed. There we go, got rid of that thing. You keep one eye on your tactical display as the carriers of the advancing Imperial fleet begin to disgorge their payloads of combat armatures. Within moments, they form into lances in front of their base ships. The Impies have learned their lesson from last time. Today, the Imperial Mecha do not rush ahead. Today, they maintain their screening formation in front of the wall of battle as the heavy ships of the Imperial fleet begin closing on the amassed vessels of your allies. This time, the Imperial ships and combat armatures will be able to protect each other with mutual fire. To hit the warships, you and your allies would have to fight through the enemy machines while braving the point defense fire of the enemy fleet's guns. The Imperial mecha begin arranging themselves in a curious formation. Some of the enemy machines stay close to the ships of their fleet's wall of battle, while others take position further out. You wonder why the commander of the Imperial fleet would disperse his mecha, especially when such a formation would be would be relatively ineffective in an attack. After puzzling it out for a few moments, you dismiss the thought. Ooh. Before the enemy can engage you and your allies, you order a quick pre-combat check on your unit-wide comms. Zaf 2 here. Uh, Zaf, Zaf 2 here, a Sadie reports, standing by and awaiting orders. Zaf 4, ready for action? What? Oh, oh yeah, Zaf 5, ready. Zaf 3, we're doing great over here. With each member of your lance reporting combat readiness, you turn to your own status displays, taking an especially careful look at the newly installed module on the Lionheart's combat control deck. So far, it seems like the Particle Storm Cannon is working it just as advertised. All status lights read green, though you have no idea if they'll stay that way once you actually start firing the damn thing. By now, the advancing Imperial machines have assumed their formation, their warships right behind them. The forward lances of the Imperial force have begun advancing at a faster pace, easily flying ahead of the vast majority of their forces. Perhaps a dozen of them are heading for your lance's own position. Valiers, the bravest of enemy pilots, are spurred forward by a thirst for glory, or as an opening move to a grand strategic plan. How will you meet these first enemies? Mm -hmm. 
let's blow them. Uh, let's just obliterate them from far. Why the hell not? You give the order to engage the incoming enemy at range. Zaft Lance quickly moves into position around you, firing, readying their particle rifles and autocannons at the first of the swift enemy machines comes into range. Hoping that the experimental particle rifle works as well as Dr. Chatham assured you it would, you pick a target, level your weapon, and pull the trigger. The particle storm rifle lives up to his name. Its name. A hail of blue fire lashes out from the massive weapon, tearing into the enemy formation in a deadly stream of exotic particles. The frail Imperial machines stand no chance. Your first long burst rips through three of the lightly armored Valiers before they even figure out what's going on, leaving nothing but scraps of debris and clouds of superheated metal behind. Oh, lovely. The, Imperial the remaining Imperials press onward. Though you cannot fault their bravery, they're becoming less sure about their intelligence and their sanity. All along the battle line, other Kodak machines are opening fire on the rest of the enemy vanguard. Tracers and charged particles light up the black of space with orange and blue fire. You fire off another burst from your terrible weapon. You barely have to aim. The sheer volume of fire means that another two enemy machines explode into fragments under the formidable force of your hits. The Imperial machines stop their suicidal advance as self-preservation overrides courage. The remaining enemy mecha beat a hasty retreat before they even come close. All along the front line, the enemy units disengage and return to the main bulk of their force. You have dealt the Imperials a stinging first blow. As the decimated forces of the Imperials f Imperial fleet's first wave fall back, the main body of the enemy fleet slowly moves up to meet them. Behind you, the warships of the Kodak battle line advance slowly as well. You've been in enough fleet battles to know what will happen. The two walls of massive warships will meet head-on, exchanging volleys of missiles and high-powered particle weapons. In the meantime, you and your fellow Kodak pilots will jockey and maneuver for advantage, a game of thrust and parry played with hundreds of massive war machines. Each side will attempt to break through the other's defensive screen, and likewise, each side will try to protect their own fleet from their counterparts. Sometimes the battles in end inconclusively when both sides consider the risks of remaining on the field too high and withdraw. Today, both sides are set on fighting this battle to a decisive conclusion. One fleet will leave this battle victorious, the other will limp away defeated and be utter or be utterly destroyed. With several minutes remaining until the opposing fleets reach effective range, you have time to consider your options and ready your lance accordingly. The obvious option would be to prepare your unit for a charge into the midst of enemy forces. Although the enemy forces arrayed against you would be formidable, other allied units would surely be carrying out the same course of action. And if you do break through the, into the Imperial fleet, you and your elite pilots can do a great deal of damage, perhaps even enough to win the battle. Of course, some of the commanders on the other side might have the same idea. Imperial lances would like, likewise be trying to break through and wreck your fleet as well. Preparing to meet such an attack would always be a safe option. By retreating closer to your own ships, you'd be better prepared to stop any Imperial breakthrough before it could do any real damage. Alternatively, you could choose to hold on to your current position in the middle of the assembled Kodak combat armatures. You'd be able to launch an attack or fall back to defend the ships without too much difficulty, and you'd also be flexible enough in a flexible enough position to react to any surprises the Imperial fleet might decide to spring on you and your allies. Ultimately, you decide to... Oh, we're going in. We're going in. You order your lance to prepare to move forward and prepare for an attack. Your unit complies almost immediately, organizing itself into a tight formation behind you, with your own machine, the white armored tip of the giant arrowhead, a breakthrough formation perfect for punching through enemy defensive lines or concentrating your fire on a single point in an enemy force. As your machine assumes attack formation, you lead your unit forward, passing the main body of the Kodak combat armature screen until the machines stand at the forefront, with nothing but the enemy in front of you. Far behind you, the warships of the Kodak fleet continue their ponderous advance. If the enemy should manage to break through the defensive screen at some point, some other point of the formation, it would take a great deal of time for you to fall back and render aid to any ship of your fleet under attack. While your position leaves you unable to respect, uh, respond effectively to the enemy breakthrough, you are perfectly situated to press home an offensive maneuver of your own. From here, 
you will have an unobstructed view of the enemy, and you will be able to pick and launch your attack with the greatest of ease. Now all that remains is for you to find the right moment. Now all that remains is for the right moment to present itself. Bit by bit, the battle lines of the two immense fleets edge closer, like two immense walls of armor and weaponry. Slowly, the massive formations of combat armatures caught in between begin to shift position. Keeping station with your allies, you and your lance mates shift with them, moving up, creating a wide, clear lane of empty space to allow the warships of the two opposing fleets to trade fire. No combat armature pilot wants to be caught between two fleets duking it out, if they can do anything about it. The sheer volume of fire being traded between massed warships would mean that any mecha caught in the fray would quickly be hit, and, considering the firepower involved, such a hit would almost surely be fatal. The second seemed to slow to eternity as the two formations continue their ponderous advance towards mutual annihilation. You take a ragged breath as you feel your chest tighten. You've seen the spectacle that is so to come a dozen times, but the final moments before the first salvo have never gotten easier to live through. You try to force yourself to be calm, even as your pilot suit grows clammy with sweat and each fleet waits for the other to open fire. The Imperials fire first. Bright flashes ripple down from the vast formation of enemy warships. An immense wave of fiery silver threads streaks toward streaks outwards from the Imperial fleet, each one the drive tail of a missile tipped with a warhead capable of leveling a city. A moment later, your own fleet responds with massed missiles broadsides of their own. A storm of metal and fire streaks past under your feet, a great host of computer-guided knights, each armed with lances of antimatter, beginning their terminal relativ relativistic charge towards the enemy ships. Both massive volleys approach each other throughout the lane of empty space which both sides Mecha have cleared. Only the most foolhardy or suicidal pilot would risk their neck in this storm of fire. Within moments, the two swarms of missiles cross each other like strings in a weaver's loom. Each missile will take up no more than 10 or 12 seconds to cross the 200 or so kilometers between the two fleets. For nearly three quarters of that time, those on board the ships targeted for destruction can do nothing but but wait for their own annihilation to approach them. But then, as both missile salvos close on their targets, the blackness of space is lit bright orange by streams of tracers. The point defense guns of both ships spit desperate dis th uh, spit <laughs> spit desperate defiance at the oncoming tides of death. Had the this battle been in an atmosphere, the air would have roared, filled with the throaty roar of rapid-fire rotating barrels. In the cold vacuum of space, there is only light and silence. The leading edges of the incoming swarm of Imperial missiles explode in an eye-searing foam of white heat as the Kodak fleet's storm of defensive fire begins picking off the foremost of the enemy's warheads. Ahead of you, a galaxy of far-off flashes show that the Imperial fleet is doing the same thing. The darkness of space is all but burned out by the light of the point defense fire and the missile drives. Dozens of the targeting AI and gunner do their best to thin out the enemy's missile attack, though many will make it through by sheer number alone. Then, the enemy's missiles pass you by in an instant. The powerful drives on board each of the enemy missiles has accelerated each weapon beyond what is even possible for the fastest of combat armatures. At such a speed, missiles are difficult to intercept, save for through sheer volume of fire, and are impossible to dodge, especially for a target as large and ponderous as a warship. The point, defend gun the point defense guns have done their job well. Out of the hundreds of thousands of missiles volleyed at the Kodak fleet, tens of thousands have fallen to concentrated defensive fire. Even more have been driven off course or prematurely detonated by the use of the fleet's invisible defenses electronic countermeasures designed to confuse, confuse and misguide missile-targeting computers. However, these defenses, though formidable, are not impenetrable. Hundreds of enemy warheads make it through and slam into their targets at impossible velocities. The blackness of space burns white-hot as the light of antimatter annihila annihilation washes out from the impacts of those enemy missiles lucky enough to have reached their targets. Behind you, the ships of the Kodak fleet die in the pitless, die by the pit, 
die by the pitless, annihilating force of antimatter warheads. Some of the other machines near you turn around. Their pilots want to take a look. You turn with them. There's a strange beauty to such death on such a massive scale, and you have never been bored by the spectacle of a warship's final moments. Before the light of missile impacts and dying ships can fade away, another series of flashes lights up space once again. The fleet is firing a second salvo. In the darkness beyond, the Imperial fleet's response follows soon after. For a few moments, the two fleets continue volleying missiles at each other. This exchange of heavy ordnance is the heart of any major space engagement, but is rarely decisive when evenly matched numbers of ships are pitted against each other. It is a match of attrition and ultimately a distracting spectacle to keep the other sides of wall of battle in place and occupied while combat armature pilots, the decisive arm, exploit any weaknesses in the enemy formations opened up by missile exchanges or errors in the opposing commander's judgment and win the battle. The problem is, the enemy combat armatures aren't moving, and their formation, though cracking under the stress of the constant missile assault, shows no obvious weak points. With an attack on the enemy fleet likely to unlikely to succeed, the enemy still keeping their own mecha ready, your only real course of action is to hold position in case the enemy should attack, until some opportunity to press your own attack can be found. Until you and your fellow mecha pilots are called to action, you can do nothing but watch the slow mutual destruction of the two opposing fleets from a safe distance. As the fleet battle drags on, time seems to slow. You just... You keep watching the battle, keeping an eye out for any possible enemy weaknesses that might finally justify an end to this interminable wait. A new comms window pops up on your display. It's a Sadie. Your wingman's own patience appears to be at an end. Boss, this is pointless. We should be trying to do something instead of sitting here being useless. Yeah, fuck it. Let's go kill things. You nod in agreement. I agree, Ensign. Give me a minute to look over our options, and we'll see if we can't convince Fleet Command to... Then, the universe explodes in a bright fly blast of silver and fire. Your machine shakes violently, as if you were suddenly kicked by a giant boot. Your cockpit displays flash and cut out sporadically as your machine's computer try in vain to figure out what exactly is going on. It takes three or four long seconds for the shaking to subside and the light to fade. What the hell was that? A Sadie gasps. At least your comms are still working. You try to get your bearings by orienting yourself on the codec fleet, or at least the lights from the point defense fire and missile launchers around it, which should make the fleet obviously visible. Except it isn't. You don't see the flash of missile launches. You don't see the firefly tracers of the fleet's defensive turrets. You don't see the fleet! You blink a few times, dumbly, as you stare at the spot in space where the amassed forces that Kodak Wall of Battle had been just a moment ago. Now, you can see nothing more than a vast field of shattered debris and a thin, hazy cloud of vaporized metal. Whatever that flash was, it tore out the heart of your fleet. Out of the dozens of warships that had, which had come to Crown Station, only a handful remain. Those on the edge of the fleet's formation spared the damage of whatever killed the rest of the fleet. The calm lines come alive with panicked voices, pilots trying to contact their carriers, hardened warriors turning into frightened children by this sudden reversal, all searching for someone, anyone, to report to. You look around for whatever could have dealt such a terrific blow to the rebellion's forces. The flash of light was like a weapon, no weapon or natural phenomenon you had ever seen. Instead, you look around for something out of place. After a moment search it, you find it. Far above your heads hovers the same massive object you saw with the Imperial fleet in the battle over Vedria, only now it has unfolded like a giant metal tulip. Its paddles stand now outstretched, and a metallic arm pointing out from the center, crackling with malevolent energy, points right at where the center of the Codex Wall of Battle used to be. The object's purpose is clear now. It is an Imperial superweapon, one which has just likely changed the course of the war. In the distance, you see flaring lights of a hundred starship drives and mechanic mecha thrusters bringing the enemy to, into motion. Now that their trump card has been played, the Imperial fleet 
seemingly so ponderous a moment ago, springs into action. With the enemy now in disarray, thanks to the powerful first strike of their terrifying new weapon, the Imperial fleet throws its full weight of the formidable firepower at the scattered and confused remnants of the Kodak fleet. Enemy combat armatures and light ships surge ahead of their wall of battle, all eager to score the killing blow on the Rebellion's armed forces. Behind you, the remnants of the once-proud Kodak fleet is in complete disarray. Out of the dozen of ships that had opened battle, only six or seven remain. You breathe a sigh of relief when you see the sleek silver shape of the Caliburn among her, her hull scorched and burning, but her continued existence an act of defiance against the Imperials and their superweapon. The storm of frantic chatter continues over the calm lines as the surviving captains and lance commanders desperately try to restore some semblance of order to prepare some kind of defense against the incoming enemy onslaught, no matter how futile. Others are considering what is perhaps a more pragmatic course of action. Out of the ships still remaining, half, perhaps even more, are withdrawing from battle. Dozens of the surviving allied mecha fleet ace, uh, allied mecha are fleeing with them, running for the wormhole and for the safety of the defense perimeter in New Libsyn. You curse the fleeing forces for cowards and turn your attention back to the enemy. The ma amassed force of the Imperial Grand Fleet continues towards you in its mad charge, but in its haste it has revealed a glaring weakness in its defense. With the ships and combat armatures of the fleet pushing ahead of, to finish off the ships of the Allies, the slower capital ships of the Imperial Wall of Battle are lagging behind. Soon they will have no cover from their lighter escort or from the swarms of Imperial combat armatures pulling ahead of them. The Imperial fleet's precious capital ships, including its flagship, are now open to attack. There is no way you and your lance could take down an entire Imperial wall of battle, but maybe if you get close enough to the enemy's flagship, you could force the enemy force to retreat by threatening the life of its commanders. The problem with attacking the enemy heavy ships is that it allows the Imperial combat armatures and lighter warships to attack what's left of the fleet without your assistance. With the majority of Kodak forces now fleeing from the battle, every combat armature will be needed to help protect the few remaining, few surviving Kodak ships from the oncoming assault. Lastly, there's the Imperial superweapon. High above the battle, it is preparing to fire again. Only instead of aiming at the remnants of the fleet, it is shifting. The flares of maneuvering thrusters flare from its hull like prin, prin, pin pricks of light, aiming the massive device at a new target, Crown Station, and the millions of civilians on board. If you are to save them, the Imperial superweapon must be disabled, and quickly. These are the actions before you. Choosing one will not allow you the time to do another. How will you act? Let's, uh, we're not defending them. We're not disabling the super weapon. We want as many people dead as possible, and having a super weapon is a good thing to get that done, even if we're not killing them. Let's go kill people. All right, Saft Lance, here's the plan, you announced, trying to fill your voice with as much confidence as possible. The enemy attack has left their capital ships exposed. We're going after their flagship. Maybe if whoever's in command of the Imperial fleet is staring down the barrel of a particle rifle, he might lose his nerve and order a retreat. A Sadie shakes her head, smiling incredulously. You're not going to bother with the small fry, are you? Your wingman takes a look down at her own cockpit displays and looks up again, worry working her way through its, working its way through her expression. You think we can get in there and get whoever's in charge of the impy fleet back to back down before they wipe out what's left of our fleet? You nod. The sheer boldness of your plan is infectious, and you feel more confident now that now than no, oh, now that you had what? Oh, that, I guess that should be then. And you feel more confident in it now than you had when you thought it up just a few moments ago. We're the best pilots in the Kodak fleet. We can't fail. A Sadie nods. All right, then. Lead us in. You charge forward, leading your lance towards the, enemy, the heavy warships of the Imperial Grand Fleet with as much... 
Ah. You charge forward, leading your lance towards the heavy warships of the Imperial Grand Fleet, as much speed as you can muster, knowing that the fate of the war could rest on the shoulders of you and your lance mates. Thanks to your prior decision to place your lance far forward in preparation for an attack, you are able to spring into action quickly. The enemy capital ships don't even see you coming until you have already picked out the enemy capital, the enemy flagship, and have begun your approach. By the time the point defense guns of the enemy battle wagon come to life, you are almost on top of them. The enemy war battleship's point defense fire quickly fills the sky with fire, but your lance mates know what to do. Your fellow pilots quickly begin flying interference, splitting off from the formation to draw the enemy's fire away from you. The few guns that continue their futile attempts to bring you down are easy enough to dodge. You press onward, hoping that your lance mates will buy you enough time to do what you need. You gun the throttle, surging forward towards the next silver towards the silver double hull of the Imperial flagship. Star Marshal Shiel Steel's flagship is massive. Two knife-like silver hulls attached to each other by an immense tower superstructure, tower-like superstructure, topped by an armored but exposed bridge and a forest of communication masts. The enemy fire slackens as you close in. The Imperial gunners probably don't want to accidentally hit their own flagship. You rush in between the two hulls of the Imperial battleship to avoid the flagship's own defensive fire as you open a channel with the Imperial vessel. Imperial flagship, this is Lieutenant Commander Alexander Kapek of the Coalition of Democratic Extrasolar Colonies. I am here to negotiate. For a moment, there is only silence. You flatten the Lionheart against the hull of the enemy flagship. If the, re impies, if the Imperials refuse to talk, it will only be a matter of seconds before you are spotted. Then, Rebel pilot, this is Star Marshal Nicholas Steele of the Imperial battleship Oriflame, commander of the Grand Fleet. You are not, I think, in a position to negotiate. You suppress a grin as you send the Lionheart shooting up out of your hiding spot with a precise burst of the thrusters. In a single, fluid motion, you leap in front of the Oriflame superstructure and bring your particle storm rifle to bear on the Imperial ship's exposed bridge. I beg to differ. Steel's lips tighten. What do you want? For some odd reason, the Imperial commander seems a lot more willing to bargain now that now that there is a giant, uh, gigantic particle rifle pointed at his face. Hmm. What do we want them to do? This is interesting. How, I'm trying to think what gets us the best. I want your fleet to allow our forces to withdraw unmolested. We're not powering down the super weapon. We don't want crown station spared. The only question is, are we demanding he withdraw? Or are we demanding that he let us withdraw? I think it's more reasonable to uh, ask that we get to withdraw. The Imperial Commander leans forward. Why would I do that? You shrug. Because I have a really big gun pointed at you? The Imperial Commander shakes his head. I have been a soldier a very long time, Lieutenant Commander. I've seen a great number of very large guns pointed at me, yet somehow I am still alive. I remain unconvinced this time will be any different. Steel turns to the officer beside him with an astonishingly sang Freud. Fire. Your cockpit comes alive with proximity klaxons as your tactical display is blanketed by thousands of missile launchers, all headed for you. The Imperial Commander has called your bluff, but your Particle Storm Rifle is still pointed right at the Oriflame's bridge. With only seconds to act, how will you pull the trigger? Eh, we're evil. Let's kill another guy. This... I hate to 
put us in the same position as uh, as last time. Because I'm kind of curious if we hold our fire, if the, the game goes into something else where we're not detained and all that. I also kind of want to make sure that a Sadie doesn't die again, but well, I think that that ship has long since sailed. Goodbye. You squeeze the trigger. Your cockpit spits pale blue fire into the exposed tower of the Oriflame's bridge. Surprise and shock flash over Steel's face before the comlink is cut off by the impact of your particle rifle. Then, your cockpit rocks violently as the first of the enemy missiles hits strikes your mecha. There's a bright flash, then all goes black. All right. A hell of a job getting all our guys killed, but... Uh, that's okay. Not much I can do about it. Anyway, when we come back next time, episode 8 captured. Until then, later.